not just between equilibria, but actually between equilibria and periodic solutions, quasi periodic, periodic solutions, etc. So there's some scope for this, uh, defining it precisely and in dealing with it mathematically. Next slide, please. Okay, so going to talk about elementary bifurcation theory and the variational principle that will help us study non-linear stability. Talk about fixed points, first the linear stability and then the non-linear stability. Track the basins and have no bifurcations, then multiple branches of stationary solutions, again, linear stability. And now, well, uh, you have to be a little bit careful because uh, the concept of dimension is used both in phase space, so the number of dimensions in phase space is actually the number of first order ordinary differential equations that govern the system. But then in physical space, the dimension is what we usually refer to as dimension. You know, uh, a point has dimension zero, a line has dimension one, a surface has dimension two, and you know, the space in which we live, uh, we think of it as being three dimension. Actually, since I mentioned the philosophy, philosophical aspects of Poincaré's work, he also wrote in a very interesting way about you know, what exactly do we mean when we say that we live in a three-dimensional space? How, how do you perceive that as that? So here, when I say one dimension, I mean one physical dimension. So we are going to see that that physical dimension is going to be the latitude. Okay, there are going to be models uh, on the sphere that where you average over longitude and you sort of reduce height to either the surface or something. And so next, we're going to look at uh, nonlinear stability and the variation principle that is going to help us to establish this kind of nonlinear stability in, again, in zero dimensions, I guess, for ODE, so just for one dimension, in other words, a partial differential equation with one space uh, variable. And then by stability and hysteresis. Next one. Okay, so now is some very straightforward math. We start with a scalar ODE, x dot equal to dot is a time derivative, equal to f of x, the variable, and mu the parameter. So the linear stability is I have an x0 at which the right hand side is equal to 0, so x dot is equal to 0, but it does not move through there. This is called a fixed point in dynamical system language. So let's consider an initial perturbation so that x of zero is a fixed point plus something that you think of as being small. And so if you differentiate, you get this, but the time derivative of constant is just zero, so you're left with that. So essentially, I'm looking at the way that this small initial perturbation is going to change the time. So I have to expand the right hand side, f of x naught is equal to zero. F prime, the prime denotes so the dot denotes differentiation with respect to t and the prime differentiation with respect to x. So if I neglect the higher order terms, it's essentially for a very small perturbation, it's going to be a like this. And again, I denote this derivative at the fixed point by lambda. Again, I think I mentioned already to you that one of the Distinguishing features of a mathematician is laziness. You use notation in a judicious way so that you don't have to think very hard. Okay, so you are left with x c dot is equal to lambda c, and you have this very well known exponential solution. So this will blow up exponentially if lambda is positive and decay to zero if lambda is negative. Next slide, please. And incidentally, I put it ahead of the C naught rather than after it, as you do usually in the same case, because this obviously generalizes to systems of n ODEs. One at n, but it's going to be a matrix, so you have to have the matrix multiplied by a vector rather than a vector. Okay. So as I said, if lambda is less than zero, then the fixed point is linearly stable. You know, this is true as long as we can neglect that order of c squared. Positive, it's unstable, and c is not going to stay small. Lambda equals zero, the stability is what's called neutral. 
some basic facts of uh, fixed points. Well, if f is continuously differentiable and not identically equal to zero on any subinterval, then the fixed points are isolated. That's a generic property. So this is the sort of stuff that I was telling you this morning that essentially under such circumstances, bifurcation points are going to be isolated. No, you have to worry about them when you get there, but not before and not in between. So the concept of Bayesian of attraction here in the scalar case is very simple. Okay, basically, if this is F, then this fixed point, which is stable because the derivative here is negative, okay. Its basin of attraction is going to be from here all the way to minus infinity if this keeps positive. This one is going to be negative over all this interval, and then finally this one is again going to be positive from here to there. Okay. Now, in, again, in this scalar case, it's very easy to see what happens nonlinearly as well. If my initial condition is over here, f is negative. So the derivative is negative, so I have to move to the left. And I keep moving to the left until I fall into the fixed point. Same type of argument on the left here, so I keep going until I have the fixed point. Here I move away from the fixed point, okay, so it's sometimes called impulsive rather than attractive fixed point, until I get over here. Okay? So first I encounter with attractive basis. Again, uh, we, denote, we denoted this by x naught, and it's natural to denote this by minus one, plus one, plus minus plus. Next one, please. So, some node bifurcations. Now we're getting a little bit serious. How does the geometry of the solution change when it is not equal to mu naught? How do the number or uh, uh, number or the stability of the station solution change? Again, we start with a scalar case. Uh, you know, when I, don't, when I don't do this in a hybrid mode, I can write on the blackboard, but given the attendance for five, it's not terribly convenient. So this is a so-called uh, normal form of a saddle mode verification. I will immediately explain why that is so. So mu minus x squared. So the fixed points are obtained by setting the right hand side equal to zero. Mu minus x squared equal to zero. That gives us two branches, x equal to plus or minus forever mu. So if I plot x versus mu, okay, these two branches are these. Now I have to look at the stability. So for x1, plus square root of mu and x minus y minus square root of mu. So putting the two together, I have an initial state, which is either one of these plus some perturbation. And again, lazily just writing lambda plus or minus c, I have the f prime of x of minus or minus c to minus two x plus or minus one. In other words, minus or plus two square root of mu. This immediately tells us that the upper branch, the one that is associated with this, is stable because it's minus 2 square mu, okay? So this is stable and this one is unstable. And I have neutral stability at the bifurcation point, okay? So here, since mu is equal to zero, neither positive nor negative, I have neutral stability with respect to linear stability. Now, anywhere on the branch away from here, I basically, as long as since the perturbation is small, I don't need to worry about the high level of terms, but here I have to worry about the voice. So next one. Okay, so uh, we study a scalar case and a more general case. So again, uh, I don't know exactly how it is in in Italy, but I think it's in, like in France, vectors are denoted by arrows, right? Uh, typically, but in the Anglo-Saxon literature, again, they're uh, just not, not uh, denoted by bold face. So this is a vector, and f is a vector. This is 
Yeah? Okay. Because you're usually by now using sufficiently many Anglo Saxon books. We see books. Yeah. Okay. So, anyhow, these are vectors. So, X and F are in Rn, and mu is in R. Ah, here is something missing. Okay. What I just told you X and F are in Rn, and mu uh, is in R. So the behavior is almost linear in all of the phase parameter space like this, except in the neighborhood of a few isolated points, which I denote by C for critical. These are the bifurcation points where the Jacobian matrix is singular. So the counterpart, when n is not equal to 1, the lambda being equal to 0, is having one eigenvalue at least of the uh, Jacobian matrix being single, okay? Then maybe, so one lambda being equal to zero, so the determinant is zero and the matrix is single. So in the case n equal to two, which is really all you need to know for to realize why this is called the standard mode multiplication, can reduce to this normal form. In other words, x1 now satisfies this equation that we analyzed before. And x2, okay, is just something that is linear and stable. See, what happens here is that on any point on this branch, on the positive branch, all the directions are stable, and on the negative branch, this direction perpendicular to the plane of x1 u, okay? This direction is stable and this direction is unstable. So it is called a saddle node bifurcation because it's where a node, in other words, okay. So for a linear system of ordinary differential equations, okay, if this is x1 and this is x2, okay, a node is one. Okay. We are trying to. Okay, okay. Let's see. Well, wow. okay. So, this one is stable, and this one is stable too. This one is a node. So, I'm looking at the situation in which I have x1, x2 equal to matrix A, x1, x2, okay? And uh, so, everything is stable, and here a saddle is one in which the x2 is still stable, but the x1 is unstable, okay? So for linear systems of two by two ordinary differential equations, a node is one in which everything is stable, and the saddle is one in which basically, so here basically all the trajectories will go into the and here what happens is that the trajectories will go like that. Okay. So, you have a saddle and a node coming together. Okay, I think that that's all I need for the blackboard for now. Thank you very much. Okay, so you see that you go from this, from this situation to that situation. I'm sorry, the usual, can you go back to the previous slide for a moment? Okay, I'm sorry, the convention is that stable branches are denoted by solid lines and unstable branches by dashed lines. Okay, and uh, on the next uh, slide, I apologize for this not being dashed, but think of it as being dashed. In any case, think of it as being unstable. And this is a situation in the general case, the reduction gives you 
one direction in which the uh, idle value will go to zero at a certain parameter value and all the other directions which will point into the plane in the way in which here was one direction. Now this, I will tell you again, when we apply this now to energy balance models, which are going to be partial differential equations and non-space dimensions, that simply what happens is that there's an infinite number of such negative eigenvalues, which correspond to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, subject to suitable boundary conditions. Okay? So, you know, again, there are people who haven't done enough math who think that this only happens for low order models, but it doesn't. It happens for partial differential equations in infinite dimensional phase spaces. Okay? Where you just have to understand how to generalize it, you know, n goes to infinity. Okay, next slide. The nonlinear stability and variational principle. So in the scalar case, we didn't really need to do anything because we could just look at that graph of f, and clearly wherever f was negative, you know, the flow would go into the fixed point. But this is not going to be so any longer in more general situations. So we have to examine the effect of larger effects. So again, in the scalar case, always start with something, you know, again, in, in North America, we say even giants start with small, you know, always start with the simplest case. Uh, actually, you know, one of my teachers at the Plant Institute, one of the founders of the Plant Institute, Kurt Friedrichs, used to say that he hated the way that modern math books were written, you know, let X be a double barrel Polish space and everything down from there. And he started, he said, you always have to start with a confusion out of which the theory arose. And the joke among the students was that you always started with a confusion, you never got out of it, but that was not. I was actually benefited from the last course of what Dr. Friedrich did on the mathematics of electromagnetic theory. And he did get to where something really interesting happened. So, start with a simple case, a scalar case. So, uh, here it doesn't look for a moment like it's really necessary, but you'll see afterwards that it is. So, let's say that this is F. Okay, that this is D, so D. D is the integral of the right-hand side, well, minus the integral, it's sometimes called a potential, and sometimes called a pseudo-potential to distinguish it. You see, you, in Hamiltonian theory, you have essentially a second-order equation of motion, and it's the potential in that second-order equation, so the first-order equation is sometimes called a pseudo-potential. But anyhow, it's defined in this way, so you have x to the power of x equal to minus b prime, and explain that the primes have derivatives with respect to x. So if you multiply with x dot, sometimes you multiply with x, but that's something else. You multiply by x dot, you can write it in this way. This is one x dot, and the other x dot is just this. You can write it d, d, by dx, dx by dt, so it becomes db by dt. So basically, x dot squared looks like minus the time derivative of d, so this is taken along a trajectory of the ODE. Okay? So it says, well, v has to decrease along the trajectory as long as the derivative is not equal to zero or d prime is not equal to zero. You start anywhere here and you decrease and you keep going, you know, here you have an inflection point, but you still keep going till you hit a minimum. Okay? So uh, x dot is equal to zero at an inflection point, a minimum or a maximum. Okay, so sorry, it says it's out of the same as inflection. So of these, only the equal minimum is stable non-linear. Any, if you go either to the right or to the left, it will come back here. If you go here, well, 
you go to the left and you come back, and if you go to the right, you keep holding the tear, it just holds the wave in fire. So with this result, we turn back to the saddle mode bifurcation. Okay, now x dot, we have forgotten about the mu here, but here we put it back in. x dot is equal to minus mu minus x squared. So v of x and mu now is equal to minus mu x plus x cubed over 3 plus a constant that can depend on mu, but if the constants are really much as it was at t zero. So here we're plotting, so remember what we're plotting before on the previous, go back to one slide. Okay, this was mu and this was x1 and this was x2. Now what we're looking at, please go to work, okay, is x, v, and mu. So at mu equals zero, this thing is just a qubit, which has an inflection point at the origin. So what was neutrally stable before is actually unstable, okay? Because they're going to hold off here. Now, if I go to some point where mu is positive, okay, for mu negative, we have no solutions. Okay, so for mu positive, I go to this place and the qubit will look like this. So it will have a minimum under the stable branch, a maximum over the unstable branch, and a reflection point here. Okay. So this says, again, in this scalar case, it shows clearly that the stability is nonlinear. There's an attractor basin which goes from here all the way to plus infinity. Next one, please. Okay, so here we're done with one saddle node bifurcation, but actually what will happen in energy balance models, and actually the same sort of thing happens in the charlie de Boer model for blocking versus zonal flow that we discussed this morning, is that you have two back-to-back -back saddle node bifurcations, one which is exactly like the one that we studied so far, and which is sometimes called supercritical because you are changing, you know, you have no solution when mu is negative and you have the stable and unstable branches as you go to the right. And this one, which is sometimes called subcritical because the opposite happens. So you have the unstable branch above the stable one. You can easily check this. You can just write, uh, you know, C dot equal to mu plus x squared, and we're going to get the opposite situation. Clearly, x is going to be plus minus square root of minus mu. But in this case, in order to construct this interesting case of a double fold, S shaped or double fold modification, you have to shift the mu and the x, okay, to this point. And so you get the situation in which hysteresis occurs, you fall off the cliff here, and I will see this in energy balance model, you fall off the cliff and then you can keep going to the left, or if you go to the right, you have to reach all the way to here to go back to the upper branch. This phenomenon of hysteresis was first noticed in physics by Pierre Curie, before uh, the work on radium that he did with Marie uh, and it's well known in lots and lots of other phenomena. So this is essentially by stability. You have a range of values of mu over which two stable solutions exist, separated by an unstable one. Okay. And this, I am going to come back to this, is a fairly broad situation in which two unstable, I'm sorry, two stable solutions are separated by an unstable. And in multiple dimensions, it's not a point that separates them, there's an edge. Okay? I'm going to come back, there's a general mathematical result that applies to so-called gradient flows, which is called the mountain pass lemma or the mountain pass theorem. It says for gradient flows, it is always the case that uh, if you want to go from one village at the bottom of one valley to another village situated at the bottom of another valley, there's a ridge between the two, and you can pass through the saddle, which is the lowest part of the ridge. 
Okay. So, uh, next one, please. Okay. Um, so, we are done now with a sort of uh, easy mathematical part, and now we're going to see how we apply this to energy balance models, which are particularly simple and enlightening models of uh, global climate. We're first going again, starting with the physics, looking, looking at the aggregation balance of Earth, again, in pressing zero dimensions, in other words, the physical space in which you just see the, the Earth from somewhere from Jupiter as just a point, to one in which you see it in the one dimension in the field of reaction, formulation and analysis in zero and one dimension, linear stability in zero and one dimension applications, non listed linear variation principle, comparison with the three dimensional general circulation models, in other words, models that sort of have a lot of details and tens of millions of variables, and then show a look also at the bistability and hysteresis in that case. So, uh, okay, next one, please. So you've seen already this diagram, essentially, about the direct tablet circulation and the wind pattern that is applied. And here we're basically not going to the point of these energy balance models is precisely that we're not going to look at the details of the winds. Okay, we're only going to look at the thermodynamics. So, you know, uh, it's a little bit misleading because any physical model should be should have an energy balance. You know, there's a first law of thermodynamics, but clearly, really, they got this name because the emphasis is on the energy balance, essentially thermodynamics, and not that all this dynamics of winds that we discussed in some detail on Monday and this one. Next one, please. So, the general principle is that there's some incoming radiation and some outward radiation. Okay, so basically, the climate of Earth corresponds to a long term equilibrium between incident radiation, solar, ultraviolet, and visible. I put violet here because I can't write with ultraviolet. Okay, and then the outgoing radiation on terrestrial or infrared. So, again, I used red because I can't write with red. That dominates climate. References Egyptian sky 8000 BC. The sun heats the earth. Zeta stone line, second part, line 13 to 17. And Herodotus 484 circa. What's wrong with these different references? This is essentially a little trick that is attributed to several great physicists, but in particular to an Italian man, Michael Fermi, who used to ask his students all sorts of questions that were not directly relevant to the substance of the lecture. Well, I'm disappointed. What is the date of the Rosetta Stone? It's in Italy. It's in uh, Torino, you know, I have seen it. You should know. <laughs> it's much more recent because the way that the uh, uh, hieroglyphs were deciphered was because it's written in hieroglyphic script and Greek. Okay. So, anyhow, it's of Ptolemaic age, just a few hundred years and not three thousand. Okay, uh, next one, please. The way these are the oldest records that I ever seen. <laughs> okay, well, even if it's more recent, even Herodotus is probably older. Yes. You know, the oldest one that you've seen is probably Euclid, you know, sure. only 300. <laughs> okay, uh, um, okay, so uh, everybody talks these days about greenhouse gases. Uh, this is what the Earth would be like, you know, with the incoming and outgoing radiation. Okay, so, sorry, my previous notation should, should, this should be violet, okay? The temperature in this case would be roughly minus 18 degrees Celsius. 
With clouds, which make for a natural greenhouse, when people talk about greenhouse gases, they talk typically about anthropogenic greenhouse gases. The most important natural greenhouse gas is water vapor. Then, of course, there's a lot of natural carbon and other such things in the atmosphere, to which we're adding. If there are no greenhouse effect, the temperature would be quite a bit lower than now, so the fact that we have clouds, you might not like it in winter when it gets depressing, but they help keep us at a comfortable temperature. Next. Okay, so this is a very schematic uh, radiation budget. It's the so-called two-stream approximation. You separate the incoming radiation from the outgoing radiation, and there are things which are absorbed and reflected at the surface and reflected from clouds, etc. And on this side, aside from radiated, you know, uh, infrared radiation, there are also there's also a non-radiative component. In other words, there's uh, you know, the surface of the Earth is warmer than the, uh, uh, the interplanetary space, so, you know, there's some conduction and convection and particular evaporation of water and so on, which takes radiation out. And roughly speaking, on average, what goes out is comparable to what comes in, but the whole trick is that the system is not really in equilibrium. You know, at any given time, first of all, the distribution of clouds changes all the time over the Earth. So the idea that the system is really in equilibrium is just incredibly naive. Next slide. So this is on purpose. Uh, this is out of, this is a colleague at UCLA who passed recently away from Liao. This was the first edition of his book, an introduction to atmospheric radiation. There was a second edition before he passed away in which his numbers were changed. But basically what, uh, uh, what I'm doing here is to show you for these various components of the radiative balance, Okay, so this is reflected by cloudless atmosphere, seven in one version, four in the other. This is all, incidentally, sorry, this is all at this point in percentage of what is called the solar constant. Solar constant is not constant, but what is meant is the radiative flux at the top of the atmosphere, okay? and which is taken arbitrarily as being 100%, because actually to measure it quite precisely is difficult. And these are just fractions of that. Say, for instance, global albedo, this, that's what's globally reflected from the Earth, if you look at it from Mars or from the Sun. Okay? So the global albedo is roughly about one-third of the radiation gets reflected. But when you are talking about what's per meter squared, you know, just to give you, give you an idea, the effect of anthropogenic greenhouse gases on the atmosphere is of the order of a few watts per meter squared. The total amount, 100%, is roughly 1,370 watts per meter squared. So the difference between what's coming in and what's going out is very, a very small one compared to the actual numbers which are being compared. Okay. So this is not a trivial exercise. I'm really showing you that the situation has gotten better, but you know, they are different reflected by clouds here. At the time, said 17% versus 26. Well, here it's only 22 versus 29. It doesn't really matter exactly what this is. This is just to tell you that over my lifespan, these numbers have changed substantially. Okay, so I have a certain feeling that just my passing away won't affect that, and it will still going to be some differences. Okay, and certainly during real life. Okay, next one. Please. Now we do have much better instruments. See, part of the problem with measuring radiation is that you cannot do it from the ground, where it's easy to check your instruments. 
you have to set up, send stuff up in satellites. And actually, an idea which was first formulated by a French astronomer at the beginning of the 20th century and has been implemented now is to put a reflector on the moon so that you can measure not just local radiation coming up to a satellite, you know, from below you and over some sort of a footprint, it can really look at the entire globe. Okay? So we have better instruments. So this one now is from a paper from 2009, which has actual numbers in watts per meter square, as opposed to, you know, percent of watts. And all I can tell you is that I don't have a good comparison in these terms, but I'm betting that, you know, I used to do this exercise with colleagues who were experts of radiation. First, ask them what the solar constant was. I told them 1370 watts per meter, roughly right. But, uh, you know, it would change from the one to the other and from one year to another year. And certainly these numbers are going to be changing. So, you know, we clearly know enough to know that we're affecting the climate and that we need to do something about it urgently. But it is not required to state that we either have measured things precisely or that we have understood them entirely. I always like to tell my audiences, even in much shorter lectures of just one hour, that most of the decisions which we do in our lives are taken with a lot less knowledge than we have about the climate system. Now, uh, you really don't know a lot about the person that you married. And you know even less about the child that you're going to procreate. That has not prevented humanity to survive by marrying and procreating. Okay? So not knowing exactly what's happening is not an excuse. We know a lot more about this stuff than we know about other things about which we're taking decisions and doing expensive things. Like throwing a big wedding party. Okay, next thing. Okay, so here the problem is compute the energy balance of Earth's atmosphere. References reserve slide to this lecture, which you can find in the and uh, this is chapter 10 of this book. Uh, you know, uh, reprint 2012. And what this is the second edition of one of Liao's book, uh, okay, uh, published uh, so 20 years after the first. So then just to get you an idea about uh, you know, measuring that. Okay, next. So that's about the global balance, but now in order to understand how the system works, we have to understand how this stuff gets redistributed. So we sort of have certain uncertainties about the GDP, the gross domestic product, but how is it redistributed? So basically, we know that it's called at the poles and at the equator. In detail, the radiation that is uh, absorbed in a belt like this, from here to here, exceeds the one that's sent back to space, while the opposite is uh, the case near the poles. So again, here is a comparison. The uh, solid line okay, is ground based, London and Sassamore in 1971, and the dash. So, this was the first comparison of this kind. You know, there have been many more since. The dashed line is satellite based, from these were the first radiative measurements which were taken by Don Babar and Sumi, same year, so this is roughly 50 years. Basically, uh, if F is a flux between two latitude belts, we have incoming minus outgoing is one over essentially the size of the belt, which becomes narrower and narrower as we go to the equator of poles, multiplying the derivative of F by uh, latitude. A is Earth radius, F was on heat flux, atmosphere, plus oceans. Okay? Now again, we know a lot less about the oceans than we know about the atmosphere because while well, the atmosphere at least is uh, transparent to electromagnetic radiation, water is not. So you cannot measure the bulk of the oceans the same way that you measure the bulk of the atmosphere. 
Next. Okay, so again, this is now the inferred horizontal fluxes. So you see that there's pretty good agreement near the poles and the equator, but fairly large disagreement in mid latitudes where uh, we live right now. Next. So this is some more recent stuff. Early is the Earth radiation budget experiment. I forget the exact uh, year, but uh, as whether and climate satellites became more current, uh, there was uh, uh, an experiment of this type. So again, this just shows the excess radiation, net radiation in low latitudes versus the uh, loss in higher latitudes. This again is a more recent comparison. Uh, from 2001, so still 20 years ago, but it tells you that, you know, there are still differences. So the different lines are, this is the early experiment. This is so-called reanalysis. I have to explain you in a moment what reanalysis is. So the national, the US National Center for Environmental Prediction and of the European Center of Medium and Weather Forecast, okay? So reanalysis by the following. There are certain things that we can measure about the atmosphere directly, uh, and other that we cannot. And in order to complement what we can measure directly but what we cannot, we use models. It's a process that is called data simulation, which is used on a daily basis in order to predict the weather, since we don't have, you know, weather prediction is alluded to already as Gillian Biakma said in 1904, essentially integrating the system of partial differential equations in time, except that we don't really have the initial data. So in order to compensate for that, for the unequal distribution of the data, errors and so on, there's this process of data simulation, except that if you want to now use this for climate, the problem is that the measuring system change, in the lifetime of satellite is only so long, and we would like to have, you know, in order to determine climatology, we'd like to have something of a few decades at least. The models change, the satellites change, and the data simulation method changes. So reanalysis is taking the best model and the best data simulation scheme you have today and running it over all the data you had over some let's say 50 years, okay? Again, just to give you an idea, the operational definition of climate is a 30-year average, okay? Uh, you know, there's a famous story of a, an important meteorologist who studied physics before World War II and after the world was over, he went to get a, get a job at the Danish Met Office and he was interviewed by the head of the Met Office at that time, you know, the world human, uh, you know, people specializing in higher firing and so on. And so this guy very naively said, look, I did physics, I don't know anything about climate. What do I need to learn to do? And the answer was add 30 numbers and divide by 30. <laughs> That's what climatology does. Okay, so operationally climate is a 30 year average. You need to do these analysis at least over 30 years and in order to see how climate changes, among other things because of anthropogenic greenhouse gases, you need it over more than 30 years. So that's what these real analysis are, okay? And you see that there's still substantial differences, okay? Next. Okay, so how do you do a model? Essentially, now I'm writing here explicitly the partial derivative of t, which is a function of latitude. So x, think about x if you latitude, climate latitude, equal to incoming and outgoing radiation, plus the redistribution between latitude belts, which I just explained before. So basically, what you are doing, you are looking at boxes like this, which go around the earth in this sense, so from the bottom to the top, and so you have a certain heat capacity associated with each x, incoming, outgoing, etc. And all of these things have to be calculated based on the temperature 
as a function of latitude and time. So as I told you already, in the slang of the field, it means we're trying to parameterize everything that happens at smaller scales, in particular as a function of longitude, as a function of only the temperature at a particular latitude. Okay? So it turns out that the most interesting thing in this model is really the dependence of the incoming radiation on the planetary albedo or effectivity, okay, where alpha is a function of position and of temperature. How is it a function of temperature? Well, next slide. <coughs> okay, so T bar is, let's say, this is not the zero dimensional version where we forget about latitude for a moment. And the main feature is this dependence on alpha on temperature. The idea is that when temperature is low, the effectivity is high because there's no ice. And when temperature is high, there's no snow and ice, so the effectivity is low. Okay. So everything else is uh, spelled out here. And this, in particular, does not take into account really cloud cover. It only looks at, you know, uh, soil cover. So that's a whole new uh, other question that we don't have the time to discuss this afternoon. And uh, so we won't. I think that actually, again, this is a good time to stop for 10 minutes and we'll resume at 10 past four. Uh, is this where we stop? Yes? Okay. Uh, no, no, yeah, yeah, hold on. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, um, actually, uh, you know, I, uh, I have to make a little uh, mathematical footnote. You know, in general, when you study, when you study uh, uh, nonlinear ordinary and partial differential equations, what uh, uh, mathematically one tends to worry about the uh, highest uh, 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 highest power. It turns out that here it's not uh, t to the fourth, which comes from infrared radiation, which is really interesting. It's just this uh, piecewise linear uh, albedo versus temperature function, which matters. So let's go to the next slide. Now you can change it by there. Hmm? Now you can change it this slide by. Oh, I can change it. Oh, okay. Stefan Boltzmann formula for the outgoing radiation where really M of T is essentially the greenhouse effect. You know, the black body radiation is given by the Stefan Boltzmann formula with this constant, and this is really the greenhouse effect. Okay? The difference between uh, the gray body that the zero C from space and the black body that would be the case for everything to one. Okay, next. So we like to find first of all the thick the, the well, we would like in general to write the solution as a function of time, but also of all these different parameters. But we start as always with stationary solutions, which is say 
incoming equal to outgoing or more dependent on k. So uh, this is alpha versus t, and so basically the difference of these two things is given by the inter okay the fixed points are given by the intersections of these two curves. This one, which is essentially the the sigma t to the fourth, and this one, which is one minus this. So if you take one minus this, you get that. And you have for the values of the constants plausible, you have three intersections, one, two, and three. So this corresponds to the current climate, and this is uh, uh, what was called at the time when this work was done a deep freeze. And T2 is the intermediate one. And so now we have so we have three solutions if we want to study the stability. So t equal to t1 for the present climate plus something which is like the psi in the general theory that we developed for the sample application. Okay, so we have to go back then to the original equation, which depends on time. Next one, please. Okay, so you have this. So in, in zero dimension, this is just an ODE, so this is a total derivative, not a partial one, in the mind. We can really just linearize the outgoing radiation. It doesn't matter an awful lot. The slight convexity over the range of temperatures that we're looking at is not big. So t equal to tj, where j is equal to 1, 2, or 3, plus theta. So that's like the x plus c. f of tj is equal to 0. It's 1 over 3. And so f of t is equal to that, plus an expansion. Or again, the transit for a moment. Uh, the quadratic terms higher. And now in the 1D case, okay, each one of these is uh, the lowest one. Well, you have to normalize for the heat capacity. This is a whole, whole different uh, issue. How much of the ocean you take uh, here into the heat capacity. So again, you know, Everything in modeling looks different from the way it does when you're really just a mathematician and you take the equation that somebody else gives you and study it in terms of existence, uniqueness, smooth dependence, etc. You know, something as simple as the heat capacity depends on the time scale that you're thinking of. Um, if you're only interested in phenomena on the time scale of a few months or a few years, you only need to take into account what's called the well-mixed upper layer of the ocean, so about 100 meters. If you're thinking of paleoclimate, thousands and tens of thousands of years and more, you have to take the whole ocean. You know? So it's four kilometers of ocean. So even the sea is a matter of uh, what is the problem that you're really trying to solve? But let's not go too much into that. So again, you know, we define lambda j as the prime, and so we have the same rules for stability. And again, in the zero-dimensional case, it is obvious that the present climate is stable. That's great. Okay, and then this one is stable, uh, which is totally ice covered. And then this intermediate one is unstable, and by the same reasoning as I did already in the general case, it's obvious that you know the attractive basin of this one goes from here to minus infinity, and the attractive basin of this one goes from here all the way to plus infinity, and uh, we are done with this intermediate case. Next, please. So, uh, however, what happens, so this is just a stability with respect to perturbations in the solution itself. But what about uh, changes in the parameters? So, I said the solar constant is just a misnomer. It's this particular parameter, which is the insulation at the top of the atmosphere. So a change in the solar constant may represent a change in solar luminosity in orbital parameters on the time scale of 
the thermal ionization cycles or in the optical properties of the atmosphere due to changes in greenhouse gases and aerosols. So again, this in this relatively simple model, all these practical questions are going to just be reflected in a change in mean. So the model three climates with these fixed points, which is going to call the climates in value and possibly number of incidents. So this situation, okay, we're not modifying the outgoing radiation, we're only modifying the incoming radiation because there is this mu which multiplies the Q naught, which is the current value of the solar cost. Okay. So these heavy dashes are the present day situation. Now, if mu is smaller, so in terms of glaciation cycles, if the Earth moves to a slightly different mean distance from the sun, or uh, if uh, the opacity of the atmosphere changes or whatever, this curve, the RI curve, is going to move further down. These two solutions are going to get closer together, or these two solutions are going to move further apart. It's the same as taking the difference curve and moving it further down. Next one, please. So now, if you are, we're going back to the one dimensional version, when I say classical energy balance model, these energy balance models were actually first formulated not as partial differential equations. They were formulated by two people who are essentially descriptive climatologists, uh, Mikhail Budiko in the then Soviet Union, and uh, Bill Sellers in Arizona in the United States, and without communication with each other, uh, it was very interesting that they were, well, uh, uh, Budiko wrote actually first paper in 68, but the one that really has the stuff in it is in 69, which was exactly the same year in which Bill Sellers also published his model. So these models essentially just calculated uh, these fluxes and temperatures and so on for latitude bands. They're really just numerical models. They're not discretizations of partial differential equations. They're just sort of box models with a certain number of boxes in latitude. Okay? And then it was a few additional people who more theoretical interest. Um, actually, it wasn't just me, I mean, uh, two other groups of people, but we all did this in the early 70s and mid 70s. And so here is uh, in really partial differential equation terms uh, what happened with all of this. So instead of the simple alpha just a function of t, the Q was a function of latitude, okay, as we saw in earlier uh, slides today. And uh, the alpha was broken up into a portion which was just a function of prescribed soil properties, how much desert, how much ocean, etc. The numbers were actually taken from sellers. And then the R out had the Stefan Boltzmann class stuff times one minus n where n is now just scale and number, and the hyperbolic tangent is again a power of six, and the distribution was the proper uh, Laplacian in uh, meridional coordinates on the sphere. So stationary solutions, climate, stability, perturbation, and verification, Q becomes mu of Q, where so far mu is equal to one. Okay? Everybody with me? Yeah. Okay, next one. Okay, so here are now the three climates, the three stationary solutions of latitude dependent solutions to that partial differential equation. This is the present climate, and this is the deep freeze, and this is the intermediate. Now, the little uh, open circles are actual data. Now, you know, it's very interesting that there is no general circulation model of those very complicated things which are used by the IPCC that fits data quite as well. That just is not a miracle. It is because certain coefficients were determined in such a way as to fit this. 
It's still not so bad, but it fits the present time not so well. Now, this, I uh, say, at the time, we just called it a deep freeze because these corresponds, this is about, you know, 100 degrees below the present climate. Right? So, you know, it's about 300 degrees Kelvin at the equator and about 250 at the pole. Okay, and this is symmetrized about the equator. There's no distinction between the northern and the southern hemisphere. And so this is all ice cover. And as we shall see, these two are still stable, and this one is unstable. So this is a situation to which the mountain pass the uh, response. However, at the time, so the, these, all these three papers that I was alluding to were published in the mid-70s. At the time, you know, there were already some sort of gas circulation models, and this is more or less laughed at. Uh, because, of course, the climate of the Earth was never ice cover. Uh, except that, about 20 years later, a geochemist with no idea of the theoretical work, because the two communities do not communicate with each other, discovered that actually the Earth was totally covered by ice, and that why, that's why now it is called the snowball Earth. So this is a prediction, not in the sense of evolution in time forecast, but it was a theoretical prediction, simply compatible with some very simple physical principles. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So this is now the bifurcation. This is just numerically established, the bifurcation diagram for this energy balance model. Okay. So uh, we, this corresponds essentially to uh, um, generalized Laplacian that corresponds to the diffusion of heat, okay, with eddy diffusion of heat. And these are just non-differentiated terms. So this is what's called a semilinear parabolic partial differential equation, semilinear because the nonlinear terms are not differentiated. Okay. So certainly the highest derivatives are variable coefficients, but not variable in space. Okay. So here you go, and this um, can undergo hysteresis. We're actually very close to this saddle node bifurcation which corresponds to falling off the cliff, and then we're very far from really coming back, if this can hold off, of coming back to the present climate. The interesting thing about the snowball Earth is that to this day, this is easy to achieve, because we are close to it. It's not clear at all how the Earth came back, because this is much harder. So not only was this a, predict, a qualitative prediction, but it was even to some extent a quantitative prediction because it said this part of the history of the cycle is harder to achieve than this Okay. So uh, next one, please. So here I'm just reminding you of this very simple schematic history of the cycle, and you know, this is what happens in the, not just in the scale of ODE, but in the nonlinear parabolic PD. Okay? I have a double fold, uh, double, double fold application. That's right. Next one. So, again, as an exercise, if you want to try your hand at this, computer sign a bifurcation for this reaction diffusion, so this sort of thing, is better known in the mathematical literature from dealing with reaction But, uh, you know, this was a fairly visual fairly simple. So, if you don't want to spend too much time, you can just look up the paper. Ah, okay. Uh, very unfortunate. I'll try to tell you what's written here. So this is out of a paper by Suki Manabe, who is the other climate scientist who shared the Nobel Prize last October. 
Uh, Suki Manabe was working at the, so, at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab of NOAA, of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, located at Princeton, on the Princeton campus. And he had what at the time they considered general circulation models. Those models you can pretty much run these days on your laptop, but they were the figurative models available for climate science at that time. And so uh, one of these simple models that I described to you, energy balance model, was done by two PhD students on the Princeton campus, uh, Isaac Held and Max Waters. And so he, he knew about those studies. And he did this experiment in which, well, he didn't call the parameter new, and it wasn't one, it was zero here, and it's minus two, it must have been the various lines are temperatures in the five layers of the model. Okay, now you have 40 levels, maybe, then you have five. But the really interesting stuff, and this is something that neither he nor Helen nor Swartz were aware of, is that these, on top of everything else, not only are they monotonically decreasing in solar installation, but they're parabolically shaped. Okay? So he says somewhere else in the model, it's not in the figure, that if you keep going, it will fall off the cliff. Now, what he says here is, uh, so Weddell was one of the people working with him, and according to the rules of the field, this is not alphabetical, but in the city was a senior person, who was one of his collaborators. So I stated in the introduction, it is not, however, reasonable to conclude that the present results are more reliable than the results from the one-dimensional studies mentioned above, simply because our model treats the effect of transport explicitly rather than by parametrization. In other words, there were actual winds in the model rather than k as a function of x determined in the same way. Now, what he does say here, and I'm sorry that you can't see it because of my wanting to emphasize it, is the fact that both the three-dimensional model and the one-dimensional model get the same result greatly enhances our confidence. So this is the principle of a hierarchy of models, which has been applied across the climate sciences more or less systematically ever since and so over the last 50 years or so. So if you want to explore certain things like high stability or things like that, don't just do it with one model, and not just with one set of parameters, but try to explain, explore the modification diagram. I told you these days people like have Dijkstra uh, know how to explore the modification diagrams of PCMs. As a matter of fact, uh, I did that with a PhD state of mind in a relatively simple ocean BCM in the 90s. So this is not just toys. This is interesting stuff. Okay, so uh, fine. Next one, please. Ah, snowball, uh, Earth, first one, a theory, not a fact. You know, uh, you know that the naysayers, uh, People who don't believe in uh, Darwinian evolution or evolution in general uh, say, well, Dar Darwinian theory is just a theory. There's a lot of people like that in the United States. They are actually uh, you know, committees that control middle schools, so school districts, and things like that. So, well, Say so here, theory and quotation marks mean in that sense. Okay, so this is now, uh, you know, I said, and it shows, you know, uh, maybe it wasn't quite a snowball, maybe it was something to talk about the slush ball, but anyhow, there were a number of such episodes, say 715 million years ago, 635 million years ago, etc., and then partial ice cap. So, um, you know, the law of nature, the laws of nature hold independently of how complicated the model is, if it's a reasonable model. Next slide. 
Well, then the question arises, as I told you, that we are pretty close to this point where we can fall off the cliff. And that was, you know, uh, very much the attitude at the time because temperatures had been uh, going up. I mean, we had instrumental data as opposed to so-called proxy geochemical data. The instrumental data for temperature for about 150 years, since the middle of the 19th century. And temperatures have been going up and down in the second half of the 19th century, and then up from 1910 to 1940. And actually, they've been going down from about 1940 to about 1975. And the big concern of that time was actually falling into an ice age. And these papers of Kubinko and Sellers was here are a serious concern. So these days, of course, I mentioned the tipping points and tipping elements and so on. The question of how close we are to a tipping point is one that is trying to be approached by more and more uh, systematic uh, data analyses. But in terms of what you do, what you can do with respect to modeling, it's a little bit difficult. This is a simple illustration. This is again just a zero dimension, so in other words, an ODE model of, uh, of an EDM, where the EDMs are the idea, we published in nonlinear processes in geophysics plus years ago. And what is happening here is, uh, uh, you know, remember we have a hyperbolic tangent somewhere in the formulation of the EBM that I showed you, here it goes into the alpha in this way. Uh, so just to give you an idea, so this is the absorbed solarization of the function of temperature. Um, well, uh, I call this this kappa, which is a steepness parameter with, for this hyperbolic tangent and extra Budiko versus Sellers parameter. So let's go to the next slide. This is a little diagram which is based on one on the, of the 1987 book that we found more clearly. So here are the various uh, ingredients in the formulation of these models. Heat flux, okay, absorbed solar radiation, outgoing our ion horizontal flux type. Deco essentially, what I showed you here, it was a cell -style. But Budiko did something even simpler. He said alpha is equal to a high value if T is lower than a threshold, and it's a lower value if it's high. So it looks, you know, the difference is, okay. So Budiko just says like this, and sellers. piece like this, which is just a vertical thing. And uh, so uh, this was linear, that doesn't really matter, it was something like this. And then uh, in the original Budikov model, there was just Newtonian cooling, no diffusion, but this is sort of a discontinuous model, which is not so easy to deal with. So these people, essentially combine these features of the non-differentiated terms with an a diffusion thing, which is a little bit like what Sellers did, but more specifically like the stuff that I showed you. Okay? So when I go back now, basically, no, no, uh, it's this. This is, no, 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 uh, it, it was okay. Uh, it was okay before. Can you go one slide back? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, I do. Because, because I do. Now, so basically this is Sellers, and this is Budiko, and everything between zero and one is in between. So uh, the interesting thing is that depending on this parameter, that we have no idea about. The distance to the upper side of node bifurcation can be very, very different. You know, we can be here or we can be there. And it's really very, very hard 
to determine how far from such a uh, application of this particular type we are because of all these things that we don't quite know about the system. Now, as I told you before, okay, that should no matter. I mean, there's a very substantial danger that we are quite close. And there's a very substantial danger that we're not just very close to falling off, but now we're sort of moving away, actually, from this bifurcation point. What's another one that is further up the folds? So look, well, uh, can you, yeah, go a little bit further back till the, we have the bifurcation diagram, some more, um, the bifurcation diagram of the, of the one-dimensional identity diagram. More, more, back, 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 no, no, moving forward, back, before, what we had before, before, and still before, okay, one more, okay, so we're moving actually away from this guy because we're changing the composition of the atmosphere, so we're moving a little further up, but the question now is, isn't there a so-called runaway greenhouse. Isn't there another saddle mode thing over here, okay, which might take us to something which is much hotter? Okay. So I won't have the time to discuss that here, but uh, well, let's say that there are models which suggest that that very well could be the case. But we're not just moving the way on a smooth curve like this, but we, are, you know, we have something like this coming up. We could shoot up as much in this direction as not quite 100 degrees, maybe 10 degrees. Okay. But maybe we should see a change of complexity. Well, uh, it, you know, as I said, there is. There are two kinds of work on this. One is of the statistical kind that has to do with the increase of variance and uh, the lengthening of correlation times and stuff like that. Okay. Now, there are papers published, uh, including by people that I respect very much, one of them having been recently in a postdoc. Okay. <laughs> uh, is now a full professor at Munich. Uh, who say that the, uh, you know, the Greenland ice sheet, the Amazon forest, the uh, Atlantic uh, maybe a lot of turning circulation show such statistical signs of being close to an inflection. Okay. Uh, the modeling work, you know, I told you this thing about uh, uh, real confidence is inspired by having an explanation is uh, we're trying to do that. It's not published yet, so I don't think. Okay. Uh, there's some evidence in the past of another. No, no, no. I'm not talking about evidence in the past. I'm talking about the model using yes. ingredients of physics that we know. Okay. Which, in the same way that some very simple physical principles led to the prediction of a snowball Earth, which has been confirmed. Yeah, you know, there were times in the past where the Earth was much warmer than today, where there was no ice at all, the Cretaceous and the Permian and so on, okay? There's no question that it can be warmer at the same distance from the sun and everything else, etc. The system can arrange itself in such a way that there's no ice at all. Okay? So, yeah, there's going to be one somewhere over here, okay? The fact that this model, which only has the physics that I explained to you, keeps going like that, doesn't mean that there cannot be something which will break it around like that, okay? So, this is just right now in terms of establishing relevance. It's not a prediction, okay? There's a difference between plausibility and certainty. Okay. So, let's
let's go back to the little story of Zaliapin. Okay. Forward, 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 forward. Back in the sense of forward. Yeah, yeah, no, well, sorry, sorry. Okay. Here or here? Here, here. Okay. So, you know, this is just to tell you that out of the many parameters that we only know semi empirically, two within factors of two or two within factors of ten, the distance to a bifurcation point can be. Uh, highly dependent on such fully known parameters. Okay? Independently of any statistical considerations based on data, time. Okay, let's finish and then we we'll leave some time for discussion. Okay, next. Okay, so we've seen this. Um, next. Okay, so now about the mountain pass level. Okay, in more than one dimension, I told you that the potential, or the pseudo potential, okay, this, uh, okay, uh, here, this is for one of these things, one dimension EDM of this combined type, okay, you have uh, an equation like this, so here x is actually the sign of latitude, so the generalized Laplacian looks like this, and this is incoming radiation, the outgoing radiation is you know, symbolized as I. And so the variational principle for this for this model <coughs> is essentially this. This is the topography of the landscape, so you project this equation onto the genre polynomials in the sign of latitude. And so these are just the symmetric ones. You still deal with a planet that is symmetric with respect to the So you're only taking the even order of the genre polynomials, y is i0 of i2. And you have two minima, these are the two villages and the two valleys. And here is the Range between the two, and here is the pass. Okay? So again, this is just a particular numerical illustration, but there are theorems that say that essentially for a gradient type system, partial differential equation of parabolic type, for instance, there are rigorous proofs for this sort of behavior that you have, where you have by stability, there is mountain pass between the two equilibrium. Okay. Uh, next one, please. So to conclude, we have multiple equilibria and possibly rapid transition between them, prediction of the tradition of the transitions. Well, to follow, okay, transitions between more general types of behavior, in other words, including periodic and aperiodic solutions. Likewise, to follow. Next. So again, I'm sorry, this clearly was a very bad idea. Uh, what's highlighted here is one of these is uh, a paper of mine from 1994, which is called Cryothermodynamics, the chaotic dynamics of failure climate. And um, I'm not entirely sure I would, uh, well, I would have to try to look it up. Um, I didn't bring my laptop to class today, uh, so I might, okay, let me see whether I can find this quickly enough. Uh, okay. uh, it's uh, William Pisa, William P. Okay, right. Sorry, I'm looking for a graphic uh, science. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the third one is it? Yeah, this is the third one. Down and okay, it's, uh, it's coming up. Uh, you say which one? 
the third one that is missing is Jordan. That is me. I think it's seven. The second one. Oh, is okay. Is and the first one is Arnold. Oh, the Arnold, uh, yeah, geometrical methods and all the major function equations. Okay, so this is VI Arnold, you know, the commander of the Russian school. Nothing to do with what Ludwig Arnold that will be mentioned in the context of random dynamic systems in German. But it's very interesting because I learned this book during one of my early visits, at the time still from the Quant Institute to the Ecole Normale. There exists a French translation, they existed at that time in the late 70s or early 80s, a version which was an exact translation of the Russian title, which was something like additional chapters in the theory of ordinary differential equations, edited in French. And the current version, which is called Geometric Methods, okay, was done by a classmate of mine from the Quant Institute. He was a student of Jürgen Moser, uh, Mark Levy. And it's uh, very interesting that, at least in the French version that I read, there was a footnote about Hopf's bifurcation. He said, I taught this to René Tom, okay, and it should be really uh, Poincaré and Donald Hopf. And of course, Arnold was sort of right. I mean, the bifurcation to periodic solutions was done by Poincaré first, and it was sort of an industry of Andorno, of hiking bit, and various other people. The reason it is called in the West Hoff is because Hoff was the first one to apply to partial differential equations. Okay? So again, this is very important to realize this is not just stuff about lower the models, the small systems of ODEs. This has been done for you know, the real stuff. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, okay, I, uh, I'll get to, get to this myself. Okay, yeah. So the first one is Arnold, and this is uh, the middle one of described thermodynamics, and then there's a book which is sort of like the antipode. The Arnold book is not easy reading for people who are not really mathematicians. Uh, like physicists and engineers and so on. I don't mean to physicists and so on. This other one is by two British, uh, you know, college uh, professors. They're not known in the field for great theorems of their own, Jordan and Smith, but I tend to recommend it to people who come from outside mathematics. It was called Nonlinear Ordinary Differential Equation, second edition, 1987. And because it's much more closely tied to your normal ordinary differential equation. You know, there are no claims of dealing with partial differential or delay differential equations or other stuff. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for the pointer. Okay, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, first of all, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a factor that multiplies the current value of the solar constant. It's essentially something that modulates the amount of uh, extraterrestrial deviance. And uh, the question is, when okay, suppose you, you cross the the, the critical parameter move. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, first of all, uh, okay. Now you have, uh, let's say, you have a stable curve up, uh, on the top, a stable curve on the on the bottom, and you cross the critical parameter. So you, you should can you, can you, end you up, can you maybe show what kind of modification diagram uh, for the PD? Yeah. yeah. So okay. you should end up on uh, on the, the bottom line. Yes. And is, is there any? I mean, the, the time you to you face it to move from the upper line to the lower line. Well, is this is again. Line, I guess. This is again a question that takes us outside the framework of the polynomial ordinary partial differential equations. 
because the basic idea here is that if you move off this stable fixed point, you are going to be brought back to it at a certain height. Okay? In other words, the median is going to be uh, the smallest in absolute value negative uh, exponent that will give you the characteristic time to get from a point somewhere here back to the bifurcation. The fixed point is that value of the mean. Now, the idea is that new changes in order to move along this curve and then fall off it moves at a rate which is slow compared to that top. Brings you back to the curve. Okay? So, this type of calculation now is done explicitly in the non autonomous setting with a certain speed where mu changes the function of time. Okay? But in this picture, you know, mu changes infinitely slow. If you are on the upper stable curve, you do not move. No, by if you don't do something to you, you are not going to move. If you are moving away from it, the stability of the curve brings you back to it. Yes? No, I mean, the, the point is that the real the point corresponding to the critical value of, of Yes. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's still stable or no? It, it is not. Stable. It is. It is what's called neutrally stable. Oh, okay. If if uh, you know you don't do anything from it, it will stay there. But if you do anything finite away from it, it will move away. At this value itself, okay, it. Anything that happens will make you fall off the cliff to this other branch. But at the beginning, when you start to fall, you fall slow, I suppose. You are falling very slow. Yeah, because right, because the velocity, the, the velocity is very small and it becomes bigger. And then when you after you start, then you accelerate and you yeah. But when you're close to the stable curve, you go exponentially. Yeah, you, you go. It, you move exponentially away, but with a very small exponent. When you are here. When yeah. You, when, you are, when you are here, here, you yeah. should go uh, with an exponential speed, which is not corresponding to the stability of. Well, uh, you know what what happens. I mean, again, you you have to distinguish between what happens in the mathematical model, which you can predict precisely. You just integrate along the curve. At this point on the curve, you have a certain value of the velocity. But what happens in nature will be things which are not accounted for in your mind. Yeah. Well, as I said, in the simple model, it can be one of the following things. It's the, the configuration of the planetary system changes on long time scales of tens of thousands of years, okay? or the luminosity of the sun changes, which happens in hundreds of thousands of years, or, or the opacity of the atmosphere changes, which happens very fast. We yeah. We definitely affect this. We 
Well, uh, you know, that depends on how stupid you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it changes, uh, you know, as I say, the, the concern at this point is not so much falling off the cliff as what is called the runaway baby. And, uh, you know, at one point it was believed that they're fairly while it is clear that what happened in Venus was a lot more than ours, because we are much higher, the atmosphere is much more carbon in it, that, that, that it would be possible for that to happen on Earth, but that's not so convincing now. That's not That would be the sort of thing that we're talking yeah. about. Okay, yeah. When we jump from one stable branch to the other stable branch, can we use like the distribution of the skin events as an indicator that we are closer to the point? Or in general, can we see is there a link between the point and the skin events? Well, um, again, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't. You know, I couldn't do this from my own laptop because I have stuff that I could show you. They, uh, uh, in, uh, um, you know, there, there is a literature now about what is called early warning signals. Okay? And that's the sort of statistical stuff that I was alluding to already, which says that because the stability decreases as you move to the critical point, the variance of fluctuations increases. Uh, you will be brought back much more slowly and you can make bigger excursions, etc. And furthermore, there is a similar consideration for the characteristic time lags, you know, if you just do a statistical analysis of time series or something that measures, uh, say, uh, the temperature of a point in the North Atlantic Ocean, etc., you are going to get uh, correlations that get longer and longer because it takes you know, surges. So there are things like this. Uh, and, uh, that, you know, as usual, scientists are not, tend to be fairly lively uh, creatures and they don't agree immediately with each other. And so there are papers that say this is happening and other papers that say it's not quite happening. You know. So uh, uh, that's why I say I think that it would be very interesting to bring into this these arguments, um, some modeling along the lines of what I just described to you, but for that possible other tipping point up there. Okay. So you are saying that yes, we are we are being talked about this literature is uh, maybe applied, so regarding the indicators, but we need them still to work. Well, in, in order to part. in order to understand better, remember the slide you know, about. Uh, about uh, predictions being easy, but trusting them is difficult. Uh, it would be useful to also have some dynamical work that is convincing on runaway greenhouse. I think we're close to getting such stuff, but uh, not quite yet. We're working hard for the last years or more close to submitting it for publication. Thank you. There are no more questions. I think we can stop here and see you. Okay, so our next meeting on Friday, uh, at 10 30.